Hey everybody, welcome to lesson eight of our pre-Columbian codices video series. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the winter solstice because today is December 21st, 2020. And uh, so it's the winter solstice today. And so I thought it would be good timing for this lesson. And uh, we're just going to look at some of the um, information that we have, again, in the Codex uh, Borgia. So if you haven't purchased this Codex, it's a good idea to do that because we will be revisiting it quite a bit. Because as I said before, it is the most complete Codex uh, by far. And so when we are looking in the Codices for information about the winter solstice, this is where we will look because this is where it has been documented. And so, as I said last time, sometimes you need to really rely on those primary sources, which are post-Columbian. You know, they're written by uh, Nawa scribes after the conquest in order to figure out what was happening. And this is really important because a lot of the information in these pre-Columbian books would be really difficult to understand without that important context. For example, a lot of the Teteo in the Maya world, we don't even know what their names are. Why? Because we don't have a lot of primary sources that were written after the conquest to explain the books, what the Maya were writing about. And so we're left with you know, a lot of information is missing. And I mean, they've made progress by learning the Maya language and by learning the language, you know, they actually wrote a lot of their information in, in the language, but a lot of that information was still lost. And because the Maya people were converted, they, they don't really know the meaning of those ancient words anymore. And with the Mexica, we're very fortunate because we have the Florentine Codex. The Florentine Codex was written by Nahua scribes um, after the conquest. And they basically just went all to all the little communities and they got all the old people who lived before the conquest. And they basically just asked them to tell their stories. And one of the most famous stories in all of Mexico is the birth of the fifth son. This is believed to be the oldest story that we have about the sun. And I've written a lot about this. I don't know how many of you follow my Facebook or uh, read my blog post, but there's a lot of like scattered information about what we're gonna talk about today. The, um, this video is just designed to kind of put all the sources together into a cohesive whole so we can understand the winter solstice with those pre-Columbian sources. And so, I encounter, I, I encounter a lot of people who will be like, oh, don't read those, those books written. They're written by a Spanish priest after the conquest. They're all lies. Don't, don't even bother with them. And a lot of people just kind of disregard them. Now, there are a lot of inaccuracies for sure in these books, but to just disregard them completely is a really bad strategy and it leads to a lot of ignorance. There's a lot of information that we can know, but a lot of people don't know because they're just throwing all of this information away. For example, in all the pre-Columbian codices, you will never find an image of Ometeo, but most people you talk to uh, who, who know about indigenous teachings will talk about Ometeo, but Ometeo is not a pre-Columbian concept. It's, it's nowhere in any of the codices, and we know that because uh, we know what each of the images mean in these codices because these Nahua scripts literally wrote the information down. And so they basically gave us a blueprint for reading the codices. So this story here, it's whenever something is written in Nahuatl and there are Nahuatl words, that's an indication that there, it's, it's from the Nahua worldview. And so this is not, this is clearly not like Spanish priests making this story up. Because if there are Nahua words for these concepts, then we know it had to come from their fr uh, framework, their, or their, um, their worldview, I should say. 
And you can actually look and ask linguists, okay, what, what do these Nahuatl, need, Nahuatl words mean? And a lot of times there are additional layers in the Nahuatl, in the Nahuatl text that is not captured in the English uh, text. And so, uh, you know, understanding the language is a big part of it in order to understand this. But what we're gonna do today is we're gonna look at this post-Columbian story. We're going to evaluate it by looking at the pre-Columbian codices and we're gonna, we're gonna, and this, I'm gonna teach you this technique specifically so that we can use pre-Columbian codices to then verify the accuracy of these stories. Because again, if it's in the, if it's written in the, in the post-Columbian sources, but we don't find it in the in the uh, pre-Columbian so sources, then we know, okay, there's something inaccurate about that. And with Omitel, for example, we know specifically that a, a Spanish priest actually came up with that word, Omitel, and uh, he intended to use that as a conversion tool. He said Omitel is the, the god of the Trinity, right? And so there you can nail it down. All right, this Spanish priest was the first to ever use it, uh, and so we know that this was a conversion tool and we know that it's not pre-Columbian. And so that's the power of these codices. It turns out that this particular story is pretty legitimate because again, there's Nahuatl text that you can evaluate, but there's also a lot of this imagery that we're going to read about inside of the Codex of Borgia. And I'm gonna go over that so we understand it again as a cohesive whole. So here's the story, I'll go ahead and read it. Uh, to you. This is actually um, a Teocali. Uh, this is a Teocali in uh, Mexico. Um, I think it's called El Tajin. And this is a program called Stellarium. If you're interested in the astronomical component, which obviously I am, uh, because I, like I said before, I really focus on the scientific uh, part of these stories. You can actually uh, download this Stellarium install um, Al Tahin landscape, and then you can actually uh, put this on your computer so you can see it just like this. And it's always important when we're looking at the sun, the, pa the, the path of the sun that we use Mexico, especially Mex Mexico City, because uh, that, that is what all of the documents are referring to. So like, for example, if you're living in Oregon, you know, the, the sun, the path of the sun is going to be a lot, look a lot different to you than somebody living in Mexico. And so that's why we need to really, and especially like if you're living south of the equator, you know, where all the seasons are opposite, it's completely different, right? And so we want to make sure that we are calibrated to that part of the world. And so it is told that when yet all was in darkness, when yet no sun had shone and no dawn had broken, it is said that the Teo gathered themselves together and took counsel among themselves there at Teo Tihuacan. They spoke, they said among themselves, come hither, O the Teo, who will carry the burden? Who will take it upon himself to be the sun to bring the dawn? This specifically is happening at the end of the fourth world, which all of the, all of the, the four suns were destroyed in various ways. And uh, if you look at, I think it was lesson two, where I looked at the Aztec calendar, or the Aztec Sunstone, you can actually learn a little bit more about that. But this is kind of like in between the fourth sun and the fifth sun. And so in our worldview, there are cycles of uh, creation and destruction. And upon this, one of them who was there spoke, Tequisteca presented himself. He said, O Teteo, I shall be the one. Uh, then the Teo called to this one. They said to him, Thou shalt be the one, O Anawautzi. This is Nanawautzi, and this is Tekwistekat. Uh, we're going to learn more about um, where we can find them in the Borja, but these images are from the Borja. These are the only images that we have of them. Okay, and so it's really important to note that uh, these images are really. Um, we're really lucky to have them because without the Codex Borja, we would not know how they were drawn, these two people in this story. Um, so this is, they're saying about Nana Watson. I, I'm actually just putting excerpts, but you can read the whole thing later. This is just like a summary. He had no fear, Nana Watson. He did not stop short. He did not falter in fright. He did not turn back. All at once he quickly threw and cast himself into the fire. 
Once and for all he went. Thereupon he burned, his body crackled and sizzled. And when Thekwistekat saw that already he burned, then afterwards he cast himself upon the fire. Thereupon he also burned. And so before this, there's a point where the the tale were telling uh, Thekwistekat, okay, it's your turn to jump into the fire because you're going to become the sun, right? And he was actually scared and he was reluctant to do it. And then when they asked Nanawautzin, he did not hesitate and he jumped in. And thus they, they do say, it is told that then flew up an eagle, which followed them. It threw itself suddenly into the flames. It cast itself into them while still it blazed up. Therefore, its feathers are scorched and afterwards followed a jaguar when now the fire no longer burned high. Therefore, he was smutted in various places and singed by the fire, only spotted, dotted with black spots, as if splashed with black, for it was not now burning hot. So this is our ancestors' way of explaining um, how, the e how the eagle turned uh, black, how, how its feathers turned black. And this is the explanation for that. It was burned as it went into the flames and the jaguar as well. Okay, but again, as the jaguar went in, it was not as hot, so it didn't cut um turned completely black it actually just uh became spotted but here you can see the the idea that the eagle and the jaguar are very courageous brave creatures you can see it here in the story okay this is part of the aura around these animals we you know in the in Tenochtitlan we had the the eagle warriors and the jaguar warriors they're supposed to be the bravest of them all and so this you know, partly explains how they got to be so brave. You know, they jumped into the fire, just like Nanawautzin and Tekwistekat. And they say that uh, though all the Nanawautzin and Tekwistekat died, even then the sun could not move and follow his path. Going back to double checking accuracy, we know that in uh, post Colombian text, the Spaniards consistently translated, translated Teo as God. But when we'll look at this a little later in the pre-Columbian sources, whenever you want to find Teo, it's actually depicted like this. Okay, so Teo is depicted as the sun, which is not nearly the same thing as God. And so that's one of the inaccuracies that we can see. Uh, you know, we don't translate Teo as God, because it's that it's not an accurate translation. Of course, we didn't have a concept of God before the Spaniards came, and so this was our concept of of the uh, of Theot. Thus, it became the charge of Ehekat, the wind, who arose and exerted himself fiercely and violently as he blew. At once, he could move him, who thereupon went on his way. Going back here, uh, this is actually. Going back to the scientific observations, and if you've read my article about this, you know about it, but I'm just going to mention it in case you haven't uh, read through it. Um, for three days, if you're looking, if you're an observer looking here, and our ancestors would have had tools in order to see the sun clearly so they can know the exact location of the sun in um, reference to the reference point, which is here as a Teocali. And yes, the Teocali were used in this exact manner because when the sun comes back it's going to start coming back to the left or in this case to the north um, a day after the winter solstice and it's actually going to end up right in the middle of this structure on the um the day after, on the spring equinox and so our ancestors were tracking the sun in order to know when to calibrate their calendars and conduct their ceremonies and all the rest but if you're looking at the sun here uh, right before the winter solstice for three days, it appears like the sun is is still. And so our people understood that to be like, wow, uh, the sun is not moving, it's, so it's dying. And I'll, of course, the, on the winter solstice, it's the shortest day of the whole year. And so literally the sun is dying because it's very weak and it's, it's not, um, you know, coming out for as many hours as it does during the summer, for example. And so in our worldview, it's like the sun died. It's it's staying still for three days. And so Ehekat blew. And when Ehekat blew, because Ehekat is the wind, that's when the sun was finally able to move uh, back on its uh, journey towards the north. And so again, 
there's a lot of science in here. There's scientific observations that are interwoven. That's yet another indication. If you see that, oh, this correlates with scientific observation. That's another way that you know, okay, this is probably an accurate account because again, our ancestors always took the scientific observations into consideration when making their stories. Thus the sun came, uh, cometh forth once and spendeth the whole day in his work and the moon undertaketh the night's task. He worked all night, he doth his labor at night. From this it appeareth, it said that the moon that would have been the son if he had been first to cast himself into the fire because he had presented himself first and all of his offerings had been costly in the penances. Here ended this legend and fable which was told in times past and was in the keeping of the old people. And one thing that I didn't include here, but because Tekwistek uh, got jumped in after Nanawatsin into the fire. There were actually two suns in the sky. And so what happened is that the Teo were upset with um, Tequistecat because of his, um, of his fear, you know, his fear of jumping into the fire. They actually threw a rabbit at him. And so um, it became the moon. And so that's why it's saying, Tequistecat is the moon. And of course, the moon is associated with the dark. And we already know uh, from our previous studies that the dark and the cold and the night, it's associated with Miklan, with death. And so now Tequistecat, instead of being associated with life as the sun, as Nanawautzin is, it's the opposite. And so there's some amazing um, layers there, right, that we can really unpack. And when you look into the codex, it gets even better. You're going to see how amazing this is. So this image right here. Um, so first of all, you have all of these birds. I'm not going to just ignore these birds. Uh, this is not the focus of our lesson. I'll come back to it at some other time. But these are all the birds that are associated with numerals. So if you were born on um, this numeral, for example, this is the eagle, your Nawali or Nawal would be the eagle. Uh, this one happens to be my Nawal. So the owl, uh, the Kolot, is my Nawali, or as um, is translated into English, is your animal companion. And so people will find if they have uh, an animal companion, a nawali, usually the, they'll see that the animal quite a bit. I was, um, I just did a reading for somebody a few days ago and I told her after she gave me her birthday and time of birth, I told her that her nawali was a hawk. And she said, oh man, this hawk, this hawk is always visiting me. And you know, she really resonated with that. And so if you resonate with that, well, that's, there's an explanation our ancestors would explain. Well, it's because, you know, you're you're connected there, you're Nawali. Uh, and so that's how you can tell what your Nawali is. If you know your, your numeral, you can look this up and then tell from there. Some people might be a hummingbird, some might, this is a butterfly. So it just depends. But the story in the middle here, this is page 71, if you're following along with your own copy of the Vorja or if you're, you're online on my website looking at it. And uh, when I was uh, talking about the calendar lesson, which was lesson six, I told you that this is a calibration page. Okay, so in one akat, Forolin is going to be the birth of, uh, of the sun after the one day after the winter solstice. And that's how you know your calendar is calibrated. If this Forolin in one akat years, does not fall the day after the winter solstice, something is wrong with your, your calendar. So yet another way to calibrate. However, this is actually depicting the birth of the sun um, in images. And so you have uh, Donatio here. And so you have the rising of the banners. Banquetsalisli is the month where you raise the banners in the preparation for the return of the sun. So tomorrow is when the sun will be reborn. 
And you can see that blood is coming from this quail, okay? And we know it's a quail because if you look at the head, it's definitely not an eagle. It doesn't have an eagle beak. This is him right here. This quail is right here, okay? And so um, quails were often used as offerings, especially to uh, Donatiu, the son. And so this makes sense, the, the, the blood is being offered. Now, tomorrow, for example, you know, going back to the story, Nana Watsin was very, he was actually very poor and he didn't have a lot to give. And so he gave only his blood um, as they're preparing their offerings. In our tradition, you would get a stingray spine or a maguey thorn and poke your shin area get the blood from there and burn it on paper as an offering. And so that's what Nana Wautin did. And so this was something that um, our people really cherished and we really, they really believed like, hey man, if you don't have a, a lot of extravagant offerings, you can just give your blood and that's perfectly fine. You know, and here's an example of that for um, an offering for Tonatiu. You find this all across Mexico, people still do this today with turkeys and other birds. Uh, you know, giving the, the offering of the blood to um, Donatio. And this animal right here, well, actually, we'll, we'll come back to this um, next, but let me go up here. So again, this is telling us, this is recreating that story. So the Florentine Codex so far is very accurate because in the Florentine Codex, it actually says the name of the son is Forolin. And it says the, na the name of the sun is Forlin because it was born on that day. And if you look at the calendar and uh, the patterns of the sun, it Forlin occurs one day after the winter solstice. And so it all makes sense when you look at the story. So this right here we know is Tequisteca. So this is uh, Nanawautzin as Donatiu. And so they're kind of perceived to be the same. And then of course the Mexica added the third layer of Huitzilopochtli. So we have a lot of names for the, the sun as a result. You can um, call him Forolin, you can call him Nanahuatzin, you can call him Donatiu, you can call him Huitzilopochtli and we know all four of them mean the same thing. And of course, if you go to other cultures, they have the different name for the sun. Um, although interestingly enough, we know the sun is very important in a lot of cultures around Mexico because uh, all the all the languages that are related to to Nahuatl, if you look at their if you look at their name for the sun it's actually very very similar and so what that means is that if, if a word um, if a word keeps its its meaning for a, for a long period of time and it does not change in related groups very much that means that it's a very um, important word. And so that we see. And so multiple names for it, but we're talking about the same thing. And this is in accordance with the, the, the myth. This is amazing because again, the myth is post-Columbian written by um, elders, but we see it here in the book. And so we know the idea that the, the moon has a rabbit on its face is substantiated because it's here in this pre-Columbian codex. So now, the, the validity of that story is getting stronger and stronger because all of the components so far are here. Really amazing stuff. And so it's night. Uh, this is when they threw the rabbit at uh, Tequisteca because he was, uh, he was fearful. And so you see him banished to the night, whereas Donatio is here uh, in the day. And so that's the balance of the two. And this creature right here, very fascinating because if you if you if you have the copy of the Codex board here that was restored that I recommended everybody to get, you will see that the authors say this is an unknown creature. <laughs> the authors don't know what this is, and um, it actually takes a little bit of work to figure it out. But the story from the Florent Florentine Codex actually explains this. Let me show you. Of all of the, um, the animals in the Borgia that have similar color as this animal, I went ahead and just 
plop them all here onto the slide so we can examine it. So you can see how iconography analysis goes um, in order to figure this out. So if you look at the claws here of this animal, they actually look very similar to these claws here. This is a sipatli or an alligator. And the thing that's missing from here is the spikes, okay? Because we know there's spikes on the crocodile's back and um, the jaw is actually deceiving because the jaw is actually a death jaw, a McKeesley jaw. So it's saying that this animal is uh, dead. There's also a flint knife um, and there's, um, there's a knight sign, the same that we see here in the eyes. Now, the Sipakli also has what looks like scales. You can see like these squarish shapes on all over the body of the Sipakli. However, you don't see those scales here. In fact, this is portrayed to be as fur. So we know that we can eliminate the Sipakli. The Sipakli is a reptile. This has to be some kind of mammal. And so we know, okay, it's not a Sipakli. However, th there are similarities in the claws. Go on to the next animal. This is actually a masa. It's a deer. And uh, this is from the same codex, the Codex Borgia. And uh, you can see there's a spear piercing its body and it's bleeding and dying. Uh, it looks very similar. You can see the fur has a similar, these black lines here, um, similar ears even. And uh, you can't tell again with the, the, the jaw because it's a McKeesley jaw, but um, the, the, the giveaway here, the way that I know this is not, this is not depicting a Masat is look at, the, uh, look at the feet here. These are hooves. And the amazing thing is if you look at hooves of an actual deer, you can see there's two big ones in the front, two big ones in the front, and one small one in the back. Look at that. And so not only were they, you know, anatomically correct when they were drawing these animals. Like they had a really deep understanding of animal behavior and animal appearance. But we know that the, these hooves are not these hooves, okay? These are curled over, these are claws. And so we know, we can now we can eliminate the masat. This is not a masat. And if we go over here, this is another animal with similar color. This is a tochli, but you can see the feet are very different, okay? And they don't have the claws that we need here. And so here we have an ocelo. And the ocelo is the jaguar. Here are some similarities. You can see the flint knife. You can see the knight symbol in the eyes. And these are actually, going back to um, biology scientific observation, these are actually indicating that this is a nocturnal animal, an animal that uh, roams during the night and is missing from here. And so the deer is awake at the daytime, so it's not here, but the jaguar we know is a nocturnal animal. So this is indicating this is a nocturnal animal. You know, the night eye is there. It even has the eyebrow, but look at the claws. There are three large ones here, three, and then one in the back. And so this we know then must be a jaguar. These are the only mammals that we can find in the Borgia. The ears are similar. And so these are the only animals we find in the Borgia um, that are mammals with similar color. And this is the only one. So I hope that you know by now why it does not look the same. But if we go back to the story from the Florentine Codex, uh, if you remember, the jaguar jumped into the flames at the end when it was not very high flames. And that's how the jaguar got its spots. This jaguar has spots, this one does not. And so it's telling you that this is the jaguar before he jumped into the fire before he got his spots. And so you have to know the context of the story in order to understand why there's a jaguar here with no spots. And so it's really, really amazing here because um, it correlates to the story 100%. 
Okay, why would there why would there ever be a jaguar depicted with no spots? Well, because he's part of the story. And so somebody reading this would have to know that story in order to understand, oh, okay, this is a jaguar with no spots and um, he'll jump into the fire and get his spots later. Amazing imagery here. The other thing that's really amazing is uh, Nanawalt scene and Tekwis Dekat, they're actually in charge of particular days. They are what we call day patrons or the Teo who uh, are in charge or guide the day. And if you look it up in the body, these are pages 10 and 11. These pages are dedicated to scenes uh, that go with all of the day signs, with all of the, the 20 day signs in the Tonal Puali. And so you can actually look through them and see how the, the different Tateo are connected to the days. And it always makes sense, which is amazing. Here it is again. Nanawat Sin, we know, is the sun. Nanawat Sin, by the way, is translated as uh, a person full of source. And so you can see there, you can see that, you know, he's got these club hands and legs. He's got uh, sores on his face. His eye is kind of out of the socket. And so Nana Wautzin was described as a very, you know, deformed person. And so you can see that very clearly here. They're all exaggerated features, but it goes with the, the Nawat meaning, and it goes with the story. He was a, you know, um, the story goes that, you know, he was very poor. He didn't have a lot to give. That's why he had to give his blood offering. And he was basically, um, he didn't have a high social status. And the only thing that set him apart was his discipline, his hard work, and his dedication. Um, they noticed, you know, he worked really hard with his offerings. He gave his offerings. And when they asked him to jump into the fire, he did not hesitate, which is opposed to the So this is, this is, a, this is a, a story that they're trying to tell us is, you know, hard work is more important than being rich and Nana Watson um, jumped into the fire without hesitation because he knew he was disciplined and he knew what had to be done in order for the world to have the sun shining once again. And so this is an actual depiction of him jumping into the fire and dying. Okay, these are all flames. And so this is um, again, if you don't know the if you don't know the story, you would look at this and you would be like, I don't know what's going on, right? But because we know the story, we understand what exactly is happening. And so all of these layers of, of meaning are only possible because those Nahua scribes talked to those elders and wrote those words down in Nahua. So it's really, we're really fortunate. A lot of other cultures are not as fortunate as we'll see as we continue looking at the different codices. But look at this. Nana Watson is in charge of Olin. Olin is the name of the sun. The sun is for Olin, right? And so everything is purposeful. They're, they're making Nana Watson in charge of the day Olin because the day Olin is the day of the sun, the birth of the sun. And if you read my blog article, you'll see that every Akat years, Every Akat year, the, the sun is actually reborn on the same day, Olin. It's really amazing. This is a, it's a deep mathematical relationships. Every Akat day, no matter if it's one Akat or 13 Akat, um, the day Olin always falls one day after the winter solstice without fail. And so that makes sense that Nana Watson would be in charge of Olin because Nana Watson is Donatio. Nana Watson is the fifth son. And so again, it all makes sense here. This one is uh, Tekwi Stekat. Tekwi Stekat means um, a person from Tekislan. Now Tekislan is the land where conch shells were abundant. So you see a conch shell in his head. And so even, even if None of those Nawa scribes, you know, identified this was Nana Watson and this was Dekwi uh, Steka. We would know just with the iconog uh, iconography analysis. Oh, this this looks like Nana Watson based on the descriptions, and this looks like Dekwi Steka. This is huge conch shell on his head is literally 
telling you his name. And so that's something that we need to look out for as we learn how to read these uh, codices is every everything in the in the scene is important. This is telling us his name. And so you can see he's a if you go if you remember the the, the marriage almanac, we looked at the the different um, you know social statuses, people who were really rich and people who were not. And so here you can see that he's got a lot of uh, riches. So it goes with the story. You know, he was a well-off person, high social status. Uh, he, had, he has an earplug here. Um, he's got a nice headdress. He's got a very nice, uh, very nice clothing. It looks like high quality cotton. And he's got a, a nice seat that he's on as well. But look, look at the day that he's in charge of. The day is death. Now remember, death is associated with Miklan. It's associated with the north and the cold and um, the dark. And so you see him, he's actually expelling all of this darkness here. Okay, so he, he's actually expelling this darkness. And so this goes with the story. Dekwe Steka was a coward. He came. He said he was going to sacrifice himself to become the son. He was all talk, right? He came with some nice offerings. He, he, he didn't offer his blood. What did he offer? He offered uh, rubber, uh, paper, and uh, quail. I mean, not quail, this is actually quetzal, right? So even way higher than a quail. This is the most precious bird in all of Mexico and he's offering it. So he has all of the most prestigious offerings that you can ever offer. And he's rich, he comes from a prestigious um, Altepet. But no matter, no matter what he was born into, he did not have the discipline, hard work and dedication. And so therefore, because of his deeds, it ended up in death. And he is associated with death because he's the moon now. And it was all because he did not take action when he was called upon. They called him and he, he uh, was scared and he hesitated. And that's what gave Nana Wautzin the opportunity. They said, okay, uh, you're too scared. Let's ask Nana Wautzin. Nana Wautzin did not hesitate. He jumped right into the fire, as we can see here. And this is a common theme as we look at the codices. This is a, a really important lesson. These stories are not just you know, mythology, like all of the white scholars like to think, they're actually teaching us important lessons, okay? You think you're, you think you have high status because you're rich and you give better offerings, you know, you may come from a rich family. All of that can, can um, result in death if you're not careful. Our, our ancestors were always saying, if you're not careful, if you don't put in hard work, if you don't give offerings, you know, this is what's going to happen because you can't just take it for granted that you were born on a really great day and the tonali, you have a really great tonali, you know, all of these, these things. No, you actually have to put in the hard work to be something great. And this was a common theme in our, in our worldview. So it's really beautiful just looking at this like, wow, this is actually the story unfolding. You can actually just look at these pictures and tell the story, right? And that's how they did it in uh, in the past. This was their form of writing. This is they would look at these and be able to say exactly what happened. Now I mentioned that um, Olin is the name of the the sun because Olin is always the day that the the sun is reborn after the winter solstice. This holds for all Akat years. If you look. At this page, this is, oh, I don't know, I don't have a page down, sorry. But this is, um, oh, actually, I think this is page 28. This is right after they're showing the birth of the spring equinox. Well, I have I have this circled here. This is, um, you can't really see it too well, but it's Ehekat. And if you look at our calendar on December 22nd, the the sun is actually reborn on Eheka, which correlates here. So what this page is telling us is 
it's telling us that in some years or in akat years, you will always, the sun will always be born on olin days. And then this is telling us that in Tekbat years, the sun will always be reborn on an Ehekat day. And this follows the pattern every single time. If you look at, uh, like if you look at my, my Tonal Puali online, you will see this pattern happens every year without fail. And um, so this is just telling us that, you know, although our sun is named uh, Nawi Olin, it's not always gonna be on an Olin day. It depends on the year. Uh, for example, Malinali happens to be the day that the sun is reborn after the winter solstice on all of the Tochli years. And so I'm actually looking at the Rapuali as I go through this. Um, this one is actually Masat and uh, this is deer. And so again, the day after the winter solstice in Kali years will always land on Masat. So there is a mathematical pattern here where it's recurring. The only time that this Olin will be uh, Nawi Olin, for Olin, is in the years one Akkad. And if you remember from the previous lesson, the year one Akkad is the first year of the 52 year cycle. So again, I don't know how they did it, but it's amazing that on every one Akkad, the beginning of the, each 52 year cycle, the sun is actually um, reborn after the winter solstice on the day for Olin, which is actually the name of the sun. For Olin is the name of our sun. And so it's reborn every year. This is what this is saying. It, the sun is reborn every year. And you can see that, you know, there's a lot of um, night imagery here to coincide with the idea that the sun is dying on the winter solstice and then it's being reborn. And so this is literally telling us what day to look out for to know when the, the sun is going to be reborn every year. But then again, on one Akat years, this is a one, this is Akat, the, the actual sun for Olin is, is going to be reborn for the entire 52 years, which is why the 52 year ceremony is a huge deal because it's the one day in all 52 years or the one year in all the 52 year cycle where the day after the winter solstice is literally for Olin, Nawi Olin, the actual name of the sun. And so not only is it being reborn, it's being reborn on its actual name. So everything is, uh, everything coincides. And so this lesson, I hope that you, I hope that you understand it so that it's, it's uh, cohesive and you can understand what the winter solstice means to our people and how this story teaches us uh, about that. Let me know if you have any questions uh, about this. You can ask me in the, in the comments, but I'm always uh, excited to share more details, but this, um, this is all from the Codex Borja, Borja as you can see, and um, I'll see you next time.